Okay, so let's jump right in. What if I told you there's this one mathematical idea and it connects pretty much everything? I'm talking about a concept that was born from a super bitter feud, like over a hundred years ago, and somehow it's the secret thread that ties together shuffling cards, building nuclear weapons, and even how the internet itself works. Crazy, right? I mean, think about it. How many times do you actually need to shuffle a deck of cards before it's truly random? Or on a totally different scale, how in the world do you figure out exactly how much uranium you need for a nuclear bomb? And then there's Google. How does it sift through billions of pages to find the one thing you're looking for? Just like that. You'd think these things have absolutely nothing in common, but they do. They all share this one really surprising origin story that starts somewhere you'd never, ever expect. All right, so we're going to go back in time, way back. Picture this. It's 1905 in Tsarist Russia. The whole country is just bubbling with turmoil, right? You've got socialist groups rising up, challenging the Tsar. It's tense. And that tension, that political division, it didn't just stay in the streets. It seeped into everything, even into the ivory towers of academia. In fact, it sparked this incredibly fierce rivalry between two of Russia's top mathematicians. And these two guys, I mean, they were polar opposites. On one side, you've got Pavel Nekrasov. They called him the Tsar of Probability. Super religious, a total defender of the old guard, the Tsar, all of it. And he had this wild idea that math could literally prove human free will. Then, in the other corner, you have Andrei Markov, an atheist, a socialist sympathizer. His nickname was Andre the Furious. And he thought what Nekrasov was doing was just an abuse of everything pure about mathematics. So their fight wasn't just about equations. No, no. This was a battle over God, politics, the very nature of reality. The stakes were huge. So, what were they fighting about? Well, it all centered on this 200-year-old idea called the law of large numbers. It's actually pretty simple. You know, if you flip a coin a whole bunch of times, eventually the results are going to get super close to 50% heads, 50% tails. Makes sense. But here's the key. For 200 years, the assumption was that this law only worked for things that are totally independent. Like, one coin flip has zero influence on the next one. That was just the rule. And this is where Nekrasov makes his big and honestly really controversial move. He starts looking at social statistics, you know, stuff like crime rates, marriage rates, and he notices they're pretty stable year after year, kind of like the coin flips. So he makes this huge logical leap. He says, hey, if these stats follow the law of large numbers, then the human choices behind them have to be independent acts of free will. To him, this was it. This was mathematical proof that we're all free agents making our own choices. Well, Markov, he was not having it. He was furious. He thought this was completely absurd, and he decided he was going to publicly demolish Nekrasov's entire argument. And his weapon of choice? A classic Russian poem, Eugene Wenigin. It's brilliant. First, he takes 20,000 letters from the poem. Then he proves they aren't independent. For instance, he showed that in Russian, the chance of a vowel following another vowel is way lower than pure random chance. They're connected. Then he builds his chain, a really simple system that just calculates the odds of going from a vowel to a consonant or vice versa. And here's the mic drop moment. He shows that even with these dependent letters, his system still averaged out to the poem's overall stats. The law worked even when things were connected. So Markov's final conclusion was basically this epic takedown of his rival. He says, thus, free will is not necessary to do probability. Ouch. What he'd done was prove, once and for all, that you don't need independence for this law to work. And in the process of just trying to win an argument, he completely accidentally invented something revolutionary a new way to model systems where events depend on each other. We call it the Markov chain. But here's the thing. At the time, nobody really cared. It was just this obscure mathematical footnote. So for decades, this incredible idea just sat there. It was a mathematical curiosity, nothing more. But then came World War II. And suddenly, this obscure little concept gets picked up and becomes a critical tool in one of the most secret, most world-changing projects in all of human history, the Manhattan Project, and the next part of our story, it doesn't start in some high-tech lab. It starts in a hospital bed. There's this mathematician, Stanislav Ulam, and he's recovering from a brain inflammation that almost killed him. And to just get through the day, to pass the time, he starts playing solitaire, game after game after game. And eventually, this simple little question gets stuck in his head. What are the actual odds of winning a game of solitaire? He's a mathematician, so of course he tries to calculate it. And he realizes, like, immediately, it's impossible. The number of ways you can arrange a 52-card deck is, well, it's that number on the screen. An 8 followed by 67 zeros. 
It's a number so mind-bogglingly huge that our brains can't even process it. It's just too big. But then, lying there, he has this flash of brilliance. He thinks, wait a minute, what if I don't have to calculate it? What if I could just simulate it, play hundreds, thousands of games, and just count the wins to get a pretty good estimate? Now, at the same time, back at the Los Alamos lab, his colleagues are wrestling with an infinitely more serious problem. How do you predict what trillions of neutrons are going to do inside a nuclear core? It's the same kind of problem as solitaire, just with higher stakes. It's a chain of dependent events, one thing affecting the next, and it's way too complex to calculate. So when Ulam gets back to work, he connects the dots. He realizes they can use his solitaire idea. They can't solve the neutron problem directly, but they can simulate it. He and the brilliant John von Neumann realize that Markov's old idea, the Markov chain, is the perfect tool for the job. They model the life of a single neutron as a chain of probabilities. Will it scatter? Will it get absorbed? Or will it trigger fission and create even more neutrons? So they programmed one of the world's first computers, the ENIAC, to run thousands and thousands of these simulated neutron lives. And by just counting up the results, they could get a statistical answer to the ultimate question. Will this chain reaction fizzle out or will it go critical and explode? In all this talk of probability and random chance, it reminded Ulam of his uncle who loved to gamble. So in honor of his uncle's favorite casino, they gave the technique a code name, the Monte Carlo method. Ulam himself was just blown away by what they'd done. He later said, it is still an unending source of surprise for me to see how a few scribbles on a blackboard could change the course of human affairs. I mean, a simple idea born from a hospital bed and a game of solitaire had helped create the atomic bomb. But believe it or not, the Markov chain story was really just getting started. All right, so the Markov chain helped humanity unlock the power of the atom. Fast forward about 50 years, now it's going to be used to organize a totally new universe, the digital one. We're in the 1990s. The internet is exploding. And honestly, it was a total mess. A chaotic digital wild west. See, the early search engines, you know, like Yahoo and Lycos, they had this one giant flaw. They just ranked pages by how many times your keyword showed up. And this was so easy to game. People would just hide hundreds of keywords on their page, like white text on a white background, and boom, they'd shoot right to the top of the search results. So you'd get pages that were maybe relevant, but there was absolutely no way to tell if they were any good. And then along come these two PhD students from Stanford, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, and they have this absolutely game-changing idea. They thought, let's treat the whole web like a giant democracy. A link from my page to your page, that's a vote for your page's quality. But here's the genius part. A vote from an important page, like a major news site, is worth way more than a vote from some random blog. And then it clicked. The entire web, with all its links, could be modeled as one gigantic Markov chain. They imagined a random surfer just clicking on links, going from page to page, forever. And over time, that surfer would naturally end up spending most of their time on the most important, most linked to pages. Yeah, you can see exactly how it works with this little toy internet example. Our imaginary random surfer ends up spending 40% of their time on Ben's page. That makes it number one. Amy's page gets 30% of the time, so she's number two, and so on. It's not just about who gets the most links, it's about the quality of those links. This super simple, really elegant idea, they called it page rank. Now these guys, Paige and Bren, they were thinking big. Their ambition was to index a Google Pages. That's the number one with a hundred zeros after it. A ridiculously big number. But, and this is a great story, when they went to register the domain name, they accidentally misspelled it. And that little typo, well, that's how Google was born. So think about that journey. We went from a nerdy feud over Russian poetry to the atomic bomb to organizing the entire internet. The Markov chain's path is just, it's incredible. And now that journey is gonna bring us all the way back home, right back to that first question we asked about shuffling a deck of cards. And you know what's wild? The same basic logic that Markov used to analyze vowels and consonants in that poem, that's the fundamental idea behind the large language models we have today. Modern AI is essentially using super sophisticated, souped up Markov chains to predict the next word in a sentence based on all the words that came before it. It all comes back to Markov. Okay, so this finally answers our very first question. How many times do you really need to shuffle a deck? Well, if you're doing a proper riffle shuffle, you know, where you split the deck in two and kind of weave them together, the answer, mathematically proven using Markov chains, is seven. Just seven times. After seven good riffle shuffles, the deck is about as random as it's going to get. But wait, here's the crazy part. What about that other shuffle? 
the one most of us probably do, the overhand shuffle, where you're just kind of moving chunks of cards from one hand to the other. To get the deck that random using that method, you'd have to do it more than 2,000 times. Seven versus 2,000. That's a huge difference, right? So there you have it. From a petty academic fight to the very technology that shapes almost every aspect of our modern world, the story of the Markov chain is just a perfect example of how one simple idea can have these unbelievably profound consequences. And it really makes you wonder, doesn't it? What other super complex parts of our world are really just a chain of simple probabilities, just waiting for someone to come along and figure out how to connect the dots?